So there we go. Okay. So welcome everybody to another Network and Learn, our first one of the 2016-2017 school year. Uh, we're talking about some big stuff today. We're talking about UDL and social emotional learning uh, and where they intersect. Uh, and we have some brilliant, brilliant people with us today, some of my favorite people. Um, so I just want to share this really quickly with you. Here we are. It's the Network and Learn, August 25th, starting the new series. Um, please follow along on Twitter, hashtag UDLIRN. Uh, that's where you can tweet some uh, questions uh, to ask our panelists, um, who I will get to in just a moment here. Um, uh, and hopefully they'll answer. And anything that they happen to drop uh, are pearls of wisdom, and you want to scoop those up right away. So um, without further ado, I'm going to uh, escape from this, and we are going to go right into who we are with today and they're gonna say a little bit of a hello. So my favorite people um, are all muted right now, but uh, I just wanna tell you real quick, I have Alexis Reed online with us, I have Mindy Johnson on the line with us, and I have Allison Posey on the lines with us and working her, uh, working her magic behind the scenes um, as our uh, kind of like our, our wizard behind the curtain is Sue Harden. Um, running our Twitter and interwebs and recording the webinars. So um, I just want to say hello. These are my favorite, favorite people in UDL. Um, I would love to tell you, I, we could spend an entire webinar just talking about how I know them. Um, but uh, in fact, I want to turn it over to them. Uh, Allison Posey is out of cast, uh, and so is Mindy Johnson. Um, uh, if you are on Twitter and you know the UDL presence on Twitter, it is Mindy Johnson behind it all. She is the puppeteer. Um, so uh, uh, she's a great. She's a moderator for UDL Chat. Uh, one of the one of the most brilliant people I know. Every time that I see her in the room, I end up cornering her and wanting to chat with her for hours. Um, and you know, Allison Posey also out at Cast. Um, uh, and Allison Posey is well. Quite honestly, Allison Posey. I don't think she ever gets sick because she is just pure <laughs> sunshine all the way through. So I just think that every time, I love her energy and I love, um, she's given some great talks. Uh, hopefully she'll do the hand thing today. Um, if you don't know the hand thing, uh, you need to pay attention because it's, it's a big deal. Uh, and I have seen it, I, I kid you not, I have seen it everywhere. Uh, people posting them themselves doing the hand thing right? Um, I almost so, painted um, it green tonight. <laughs> I know. So you started a movement, which I'm super, super excited about. Uh, so, um, and then uh, we have Alexis Reed and um, we were to have another panelist and it doesn't look like uh, Jennifer Cates, uh, Dr. Jennifer Cates has, has joined us just yet. Hopefully she'll join us in a little bit. Um, but uh, with that, I want to turn it over to you guys to kind of uh, give yourselves a little introduction. I want to start with uh, Alexis. Um, so go ahead, Alexis. Tell us where you're at, where you're from, what you're thinking, like where you're at as a person right now. No, I'm just kidding. You can just tell us whatever you want. <laughs> so should we go back to where we started? It's Alexis, yeah. not Alexa. I can't yes. pick for you automatically or do research yes. unless I have Google. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the best. <laughs> Alexa, can you find a station, a station for me that I might like? <laughs> sure, how about Pearl Jam? <laughs> right, They're fantastic, even better, right? <laughs> so Alexis, tell us where you're from, what you're doing, uh, where you're at with UDL, all of that sort of fun stuff. Cool, I am in Boston. I currently am working for the Boston Child Study Center as a um, coordinator of educational services and doing some direct service, uh, specifically with executive function and executive therapy, um, educational therapy with students and some parent coaching. So kind of taking some of the components of UDL and putting them into practice. Um, I've worked in schools for over a decade and this is my first year not setting up a classroom right now, so I'm a little jittery and anxious to be away and missing everybody and all the kids. Um, but I've already gotten emails from parents saying that we need to get together with kids, so it fills the gaps. Um, I've been connected with CAST for almost eight years now since I started my journey here in Boston and have been fortunate to work on a lot of different levels and get to know Mindy and Allison very well and do a lot of great work through the CAST UDL cadre, going out in the field and facilitating online courses and really just having the opportunity to, to spread the UDL wisdom and the gifts that it brings to us in education to help guide us in our journey. So 
And check out the background, folks. Look, <laughs> this woman never stops working. Look at that back there. It never true. stops working. So Even if you want to stop, it's all here. Right? She is a, <laughs> she is a UDL gorilla. Uh, she is. She's taken over, right? Um, oh, so thank you so much for being here, Alexis. Uh, uh, Allison? You, you got anything else Hi, to tell Hi, I'm Allison Posey. Usually I live in Boston, Massachusetts, but I'm out in uh, Durango, Colorado right now visiting my family and um, I'm in love with it out here. So if any of you are calling in from the West Coast, um, you've got a pretty nice deal out here. Um, I went to graduate school for Mind, Brain and Education where I met David Rose and first heard about Universal Design for Learning. And for me, it was the framework that um, really did the best job taking um, brain science that was happening in the constraints of an fMRI scanner with people lying totally flat and trying to make it connect to the busy bustling classroom environment. Um, I was a high school science teacher. Um, I've, I've taught as young as sixth grade and I've taught as and I, I, I work with adult learners now um, in my job at CAST where I really get to see UDL in action in so many different ways all across the country. It looks different every where I go but literally every time I talk to someone out in the field who knows about UDL and is, is practicing UDL it's it's like this really deep connection that we have and and really an amazing conversation that ensues about the learning process at a really deep high level so I love my job I love getting to um, to work with the field like Alexis I miss my students tremendously um, but to get to see um, UDL in action from you all in the field is really a gift so um, I'll be back uh, in the office Monday <laughs> and see I see what I told you folks I'm already excited no I don't even know what we're gonna be talking about and Allison just is, does a great job of hyping me up I'm ready to go uh, I, don't, I, we, I don't even care what it is anymore so uh, thank you Allison, <laughs> for being here um, and uh, Allison Allison you know she's so humble but um, and and Alexis, you being part of the, the country and Mindy, you working with her directly. We know that Allison's a workhorse too. She's you know she's uh, she's a superstar, um, and uh, she coordinates she coordinates a lot. Uh, instructional designer, uh, professional development coordinator, like she is all over everything. So um, and and the cast symposium that just happened, um, and she gives killer talks. Um, so I'm glad to have you here. Uh, and the field really made that symposium. I just want to, you know, just give a shout out to the presenters and the folks who really made that come to life for us. Yeah. So that was really exciting. Okay. <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. Uh, so now I'm going to kick it over to, to Mindy. Uh, Mindy, tell us a little something about you and your job at CAST. Sure. Um, I'm Mindy and I'm a, an instructional designer, social media and communication strategist. So. I do a lot on Twitter. I think I was counting the other day. I think I run 23 accounts. Um, so I have multiple, multiple, multiple personalities. <laughs> um, and you'll have to excuse my dog. There was somebody at my door. <laughs> so my dog's kind of going nuts. Um, if you're on Twitter or um, you'll, you've probably seen pictures of him. Um, but mostly what I do, I work, I used to be a high school special education teacher. Um, I was a collaborative teacher, so I worked mostly in science classrooms, um, a history class, a math class. Um, but uh, actually most of what I did was UDL, even though I didn't know what UDL was at the time. Um, but so I would work with um, teachers and um, I was responsible for the students who had special needs in the classroom, but basically I co-taught, so um, I was responsible for, um, I, I took on the responsibility of all the students in the classroom, so that was my role, and now I get to build cool tools and play on social media and present sometimes and hang out, and it's fun. <laughs> so that's what I do. Yeah, so just a couple things, just a couple yeah, things, 23 things. personalities. <laughs> 23, 23 personalities. Yeah, she is Twitter. I don't know if you know that or not, folks, but if, it, if it's Twitter, it's pretty much synonymous. With it. uh, and so and we just had Kim Coy, the lovely Kim Coy, join us too. Uh, Kim, are you out there? Do you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Of course we can. Uh, That's Kim, so awesome. We're doing a quick, uh, just a quick intro, and then we're going to jump right into some questions. So uh, why don't you, I, I didn't get a chance to, 
tell everybody about you uh, in, with my own personal narrative. So I'm just going to let you speak on your brilliance all by yourself. <laughs> okay. So um, I am happy to be here. I am a professor at Fresno State or California State University, Fresno. So I'm lucky enough to help people in the classroom get ready to teach special and then we have a master's program, so get better at it. Um, I am so excited to be part of the UDL IRN and all of its wonderful things, and I've known Dean and Mindy, and I don't know who else is here, sorry, uh, for a long time, and I'm happy to be here. Right, so, uh, and uh, Kim, Kim is not telling you how, what a creative force she is. Um, I had the distinct pleasure of being uh, part of a presentation with both Kim and uh, John Mundorf, Jay Money, the Fundorf, um, <laughs> and it was by far one of the best things that I've ever been a part of. So I am so excited to see you here. Um, and as I said before, we have um, uh, we have Sue Harden uh, from the UDL IRN board as well. Um, she is running Twitter uh, behind the scenes for us today, um, uh, much like the Wizard of Oz, uh, the Wizard behind the Great Curtain. So I'm just the big head. I'm just the big head, folks. Uh, so today we're talking about UDL and social emotional learning. Let's get into some questions. Let's have some deep conversation. Let's uh, drop some knowledge bombs and uh, find some brilliance. So here I'm going to uh, post up. I'm sorry. Uh, where did it go? Uh, I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to post up the first question, folks. If you have questions around what our or what our wonderful panelists uh, are saying or you want some clarification, please do not forget to tweet it out uh, and see we'll catch you there. Or if you are viewing this webinar, um, try to drop a question in for us, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen real quick and I'll pull up our first question. Here we go. Uh, I'm gonna also present it so it, seemed, so it looks a little bit bigger. Uh, so question one is very basic. Uh, you've just happened on the scene. What is social emotional learning? Uh, what is the importance of social emotional learning in your context within schools themselves? I'm going to give our panelists a, a few minutes to uh, kind of um, look at the look at the question, let you folks kind of look at it, and then I'm going to bump it back uh, to our panel um, so that we can kind of talk about it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to jump right to um, who's the first person on my list here. I'm going to start with Allison on this one. Um, Allison, why don't you give us your take on, uh, on um, social emotional learning and why it's so important in schools. Uh, Allison, you're muted right now. So, so nobody's hearing that brilliance. I'm going to talk away and you can't hear anything and yeah. you'll know. I was, I was dying <laughs> for it. I was dying for it. So, so go ahead. You're unmuted now. Go for it, Allison. Well, go ahead. You know, I wasn't going to start with it, but I'm going to start with it. Uh, Brian had mentioned um, the way I like to talk about the brain is through my fist. Uh, looks like a goofy puppet, but uh, if you imagine your, your fist is your brain and your arm is your spinal cord and you get into your brain, the brain's all convoluted. Actually, here's a fun fact I don't always talk about. If you actually unfold the, fo the folded part of your brain, it's about the size of, a, of a, piece of new a piece of newspaper and it's all crumpled up inside of our brain there. So uh, when we think of our brain, we often think of cognition and we think of executive function and we even think of what we see and smell and and all of that gets processed here in the cortex of our brain. But the whole middle part of our brain, what I like to show is the middle part of the brain, that's the affective network. That's our emotion center. And in order to even get to these higher order learning centers, we have to address emotion. And when I was in graduate school, um, actually my whole life um, in education, um, I've always felt like emotion was extremely important for my students um, and their learning. And Neuroscience is catching up and saying, yes, in fact, it is unbelievably important for learning. Um, in fact, it, when there is damage to emotion networks, it's learning that gets compromised. But in all of my schooling and in all of my work, I rarely was taught strategies to really deal with emotion in a classroom. And I don't know if it's because um, we're nervous about it, because if the student says something that's really highly emotional, uh, that's scary, that's really scary. And I know about science, I taught the scientific method and the stages of cell division and photosynthesis, and that feels very easy, it's very concrete. But you start getting into how students are feeling in a moment um, as they go to do group work or as they go to do a lab or as I'm throwing big words at them um, in a lecture, and that feels 
muddy, it feels messy, it feels scary. Um, so it's very easy to just say, I'm gonna deal with this um, concrete, conceptual understanding, um, and, and we just can't do that as educators. We really have to address this social, this, this emotional component um, that's present at all times. Um, literally everything we do is emotional. Um, it's grounded and, and rooted in emotion. So um, gosh, have I, your question was, what is social emotional learning? You don't learn without emotion. And so I think social emotional learning is learning. Um, it's what we're doing all the time. Even in, in this kind of interaction where I'm looking and talking at my computer screen, we are having a social emotional experience right now that is changing our brain. See, see, drop the mic. That's how we start it, folks. That's how we start it. <laughs> did I even answer off. your question now? Yes, yes, you did. Uh, I'm going to jump over to Alexis. Alexis, what do you got for us? So what is the most in my right? treasure trove of books, and I promise this wasn't scripted, I happen to have taken this one out. If anybody is interested, this is a fabulous book. And to go along with what Allison just said, give me a moment to read this to you. The two structures in the brain mainly responsible for long-term remembering are located in the emotional areas of the brain, the hippocampus and the amygdala. So we need to realize that there is no such thing as separating learning and emotion. It's all interrelated. Um, I am a Montessori kid who was educated as a preschooler in a Montessori school, and it was all about developing the entire child. And I was kind of raised that way. And through my entire educational career, I was very curious and, and was guided by what felt right and what felt good for myself and others. And I think that we are really overly consumed with giving content to students and calling that learning rather than it becoming this emotional um, experience that everyone gets involved in. And it's related to not just memorizing facts, but to really obtain knowledge and, and utilizing it in a, an effective, efficient, and meaningful way. So that's not exactly what social emotional learning means to me. There's a, a whole more, <laughs> a bigger answer than that. But what Allison just said was so directly related to what I just reread yesterday. So I'm glad to share it. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, and, and it's almost like it was scripted. That's fantastic. Yeah. But not, but it wasn't. It totally not wasn't. Yeah, we are we are building the plane as we're flying it here. Uh, so we don't we don't script anything. That's we try to keep it as real as we can. Um, so I'm going to uh, kick it over to Mindy as well. Uh, Mindy, social emotional learning. What is it? Yeah. Why is it so important? Well, I think so. I'm not an expert on the brain, but I work at a place where I work with a lot of people who are experts on the brain. Um, but I know my experience as a classroom teacher. And um, to me, social emotional learning is, um, well, actually, I had to, I looked it up. Um, have you been to the cat? Sorry, that's my dog back there. <laughs> that's, he's social and emotional too. Um, I knew he would try to make an appearance somehow. <laughs> right, see? Um, but he, uh, I actually looked at the website Castle. I think it's pronounced Castle. Um, and they define it, they define so social emotional learning as the process through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships and make responsible decisions. So that's how they define social emotional learning. And that sounded so much. Oh, no, you dropped out on us, Mindy. Uh, but I think you were previewing question two as well with that. So that's what I thought she was going to say too. Right. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe Mindy's doing that really cool thing where like you freeze, like you act like you, you've just dropped out. And then you do it for dramatic pause <laughs> like that. But I, I, I hope that she's going to come back. Uh, so Kim, I see that you are, I see your head coming up and down. Um, what do you got for us? Are you hey. working out right now? Yeah. <laughs> I'm so impressed by, by all of you ladies. I'm so impressed that you are all so dedicated and doing so many things. I'm barely keeping it together with one thing tonight. Kim, what do well, you got there? I thought, you know, I was going to do without showing myself. And then I'm like, this is social emotional learning. Because I got kind of um, a little bit hot and bothered today. So sometimes the only way I can help is just to work out. Oh, and my daughter's getting married. And 
address. So this is. Uh oh. I'm still on. Kim, you're breaking up on us. Frozen for. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, that's much better. We got you. Okay. So social emotional learning for me is to remember that every person, every human we run into, so every human we're teaching has this. And what's great about working here in Fresno is that we have most 60% or more of our students are first generation and 60% or more are students of poverty. So if we're not reaching their social emotional needs, even on the teacher preparation level, we're not going to get anybody anywhere. And the schools that we get to work in are even higher than that. So social emotional learning, if you're not going to get that, then you're not going to get anybody. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really great point. And um, uh, why I'm so glad that you're in, Kim, uh, and I was hoping that uh, Dr. Cates would also be able to provide to this. Uh, because up in, up in Canada, you know, they're working a lot with First Nation individuals and they're working a lot with um, uh, uh, a lot of poverty, a lot of other issues. So there, you know, when we speak about inclusive e education here in, in America, uh, up until very recently, that inclusive education was just another term for special education. Um, yeah. and, and I think that, you know, we are finding in uh, the work that's being done up in Manitoba and Winnipeg area, um, and throughout the world, really, is that we're finding if inclusive education is really about a lot of other groups, you know, yeah. about our first generations, about our ESLs, about our newcomers, about, you know, poverty, about a lot of things. And I think that, um, I think that all, all, um, <clears throat> all four of you women have really hit on this idea um, of, of you're not going to get anywhere until you can get, until you can get deep into, into what makes it important, right? Um, so if I could surmise that, um, um, but Mindy, you dropped out on us. So I, I wanted to give you a chance to, to finish the, the knowledge bomb before I moved on to question. <laughs> Sorry. It wasn't much of a knowledge bomb, but I don't know what happened. My internet dropped and everything went poop. Um, I was just going to, I was just, I think I was, what I was going to say was that, um, so students would stop by my office all the time. Cause I worked in a, in a resource room with about seven other teachers and, it was so, it, it, inevitably, some student would come and say, oh, I broke up with my boyfriend. Oh, I broke up with my girlfriend. I can't work today. Or, you know, like, uh, something happened at home. I can't, I can't do school right now because something was disrupting my emotions. Something is, something's wrong. I can't get to, you know, I can't, I can't focus today. Um, and, and it just, it brings home that, and, and, and it, every teacher has experienced that, you know, something happens in the morning, the kid doesn't have breakfast, they can't, you know, get it together to do the rest of the day. In high school, it's, you know, all of these relationships, all of these hormones are going crazy, and everything is the most important thing ever. Um, but, <laughs> so it's, it just, it brings home the point that emotions are so central to um, whether or not we're able to get to the action and expression of what we know and the and even seeing or hearing or understanding the representations that we're being given. So that's all I wanted to say. If I can tag on to Mindy and just say the brain science. So the emotion networks not only are connecting with these higher order centers, but they're also connecting intricately with our basic physiology. So like you're saying, your heart rate, your blood pressure, your blood sugar level, where, you know, how much glucose is there? That's absolutely influencing all of those brain networks. And we know that um, there were some interesting studies with um, some teenagers and that, that frontal part of your cortex is doing its last big growth um, during your teenage years through the 20s. So sometimes I joke my 30 year old brother is still his frontal lobe is still growing um, but what they find is actually that the emotion networks um, actually are more connected to the frontal cortex the goal-driven areas then the cortex is to the emotion centers which means the emotions are actually driving those goals and um, and driving our ability to progress monitor and and show what we know so neurologically everything Mindy's saying from a classroom teacher experience is what we see in the brain. It's just so cool. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great point uh, and brings us really to, the, to that next question. Um, and that next question is uh, where, where, do social, where does social emotional learning and, where, and UDL, Universal Design for Learning, really where do they intersect? Um, and I think that uh, Allison, you've given a great kind of preview 
of, of that question. And I think, uh, Mindy, you were previewing, I think all of, all of you were really previewing this question because it's really our big question, right? Like, um, so great, we're all here because, because of UDL. Um, and we all know that social emotional learning uh, to a certain extent, whether it's from is something instinctual or to something that we've studied to the brain science to we just know when a kid comes in and puts their head down that we got to take care of something uh, because maybe that kid's just not ready to learn about Lord of the Flies today, right? Um, so, but but there's some place that where what we believe in, in as the frameworks of UDL that they have to intersect with social emotional learning. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to you guys again. Um, and uh, I am going to, well, I'm going to, I, you know, I started to calling out uh, in the beginning, but now I'm just gonna let it be a free for all. I'm gonna let you go. So everybody unmute your mics and go. One, two, three, answer. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Kimberly. So I just yeah. wanna say that um, I think social, I think it starts with planning. And I think it starts with planning for a variety of learners in your classroom. And I think it starts with planning for a variety of parents and administrators. One of the projects that we're going to do right now is um, we're going to UDL of an elementary school office. We're doing, you know, trying to do that and do a study on it. And I think the social emotional part is one of the most important things. So planning for what people need and then planning a way to provide it for them within the guidelines. Yeah, I very similar to that. I often have conversations with parents and educators who are like, I've presented the information I'm trying to get across in all these different ways. Why aren't they engaged? And often my response is, did you ask them what they need? <laughs> did you uh, figure out what's going on in their life? And mm -hmm. oftentimes just engaging in that conversation and trying to target those social emotional triggers that are happening underneath the iceberg that we don't see that are presenting these disengaged behaviors makes a world of difference. Just a simple question can go a really long way. So thinking about needs, I think that's what it takes. Yeah. And I really like the way universal design for learning defines engagement mm -hmm. in emotional learning. For me, it went um, beyond, it, it again was, was something that was muddy that I hadn't really learned about, um, but the way that UDL defines access level of just simple, simple are they interested in it? Um, are there distractions or threats in the environment? Just kind of doing, um, as, as both Kimberly and Alexis were saying, just a simple assessment of, of that, that kind of access level around engagement and then thinking, well, how can we support them in persisting through challenges? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, in, in, in thinking about that, we think about how we're giving feedback, how we're helping them to set goals, do the resources that we're offering um, meet the demands that we're expecting? Um, and are we addressing that variability? Again, that that um, both Alexis and, um, and Kimberly talked about. And then finally, the kind of the internal intrinsic motivation that we're going for is are they able to self-regulate? And so, oh, lovely, we have an image here. <laughs> so here, yeah, those are the UDL guidelines and really thinking about um, from an access point to an intrinsic motivation level, there are strategies that we can use that UDL really helps us think about proactively de de designing for in the learning environment from the beginning so that, um, so that learners really are able to be um, motivated and, um, and interested learners, uh, regardless of, you know, it might be a topic like photosynthesis, but they're able to persist and really uh, get something from it. You know, it's funny, um, a couple years ago, uh, Chris Lehman, um, L-E-H-M-A-N-N, -N, he's the um, founding principal at Science Leadership Academy in Philadelphia. Um, he did a presentation at ISTE, at the ISTE conference a couple of years ago um, on personalized learning. And he said, personalized learning is not what everybody's telling you it is. <laughs> personalized learning to me is when the learning that I'm doing is making a difference in my life. Mm -hmm. or that the learning I'm doing is helping me to make a difference in my life or someone else's life that I care about. Um, and that's really what his, his philosophy of personalized learning is. Now, personalized learning is now, you know, a different kind of thing, and it incorporates UDL and, and all of that great stuff. But I, I've always sort of thought about that when I think about, um, you know, how, how we connect the UDL guidelines to either personalized learning or this the social emotional learning. I mean, that whole left side, it used to be the right side, but now it's the left side of the guidelines. 
um, is about social emotional learning. And it's, there's such a misunderstanding that <clears throat> engagement is, like Allison was saying, that engagement is just about getting attention. Like you've got to be the, you know, I mean, we, the performer, you've got to do that anticipatory set in your lesson. You've got to, you know, whatever gets their attention, but it's engagement isn't about that. That's, that, that's very, very short lived engagement. Mm -hmm. um, but if it means something to me, if it, if I care about it, if it's, if it's going to impact my life or somebody else's life that I care about, then I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to persist if it's, if it's difficult. And that's, I mean, and that's the grit. That's the grit that, that everybody, you know, that's the new education buzzword now is grit. Um, that's what everybody that really shows about. how the engagement principle aligns to the other ones, because as you were saying, you know, that, that really, if you have that sort of, um, that intrinsic motivation, um, you're able to have much better executive function. You're able to build your background comprehension in a really nice way. You read my mind, Allison. I was just thinking about how the engagement principle actually drives all else. So you can actually access um, something that's presented if you don't have that connection. You don't feel that you have the resources to be able to um, access what you're being asked to do or to even follow through on a plan. So it's it's so important. You know, I so I I love um, what you've all really summed up because it really talks about the residuals of education, right? And the residuals of education when they've done the when they did the meta study around what are the residuals of education, nobody said I want a great test taker. Nobody said I want you know I I want a, a mathematician even right or an engineer. What they said were what were things like I want somebody who's curious. I want somebody who has who has this perseverance, right? I want somebody who has these things. All of those things make up the mind of an engineer or make up the mind of a mathematician or a writer or whatever. But nobody said, right, I want kids who can crunch numbers like you wouldn't believe, mm -hmm. right? They don't say that, right? Because those aren't the residuals. And all of those residuals in that listing, all of those residuals have everything to do with social emotional learning. And I think that Mindy, Allison, Alexis, all of you have brought up this really great point about the idea of the point of engagement as opposed to the task at hand, mm -hmm. right? And, and we in education are very, very frightened by the idea of disengagement. Oh, right? There's a scary thing. Well, that that's, that's, when they, that's when they misbehave, right? That's right. when they get, the classroom gets out of control and right, you've, right. Got to send, you've got to do a bunch of write-up slips, you know? <laughs> right. And we believe that we have control of that, right? Like, like instead of thinking, well, disengagement naturally happens, right? Like it naturally is going to happen. People are going to be disengaged even in this brilliant webinar right? But there's going to be those points where it happens. And we spend a lot of time planning for the point of engagement, but not for engagement along the task. And really but, can't play for, plan for that. I don't know. I think you can plan for disengagement. And I think you can even prepare learners and yourself for it by saying, when you are disengaged, these are some activities you can do that are appropriate in this classroom. Like I tell my students in two hour seminars, if you need to check your Facebook page in order to come back and participate, Check your Facebook page. Yes. yes. And it's because it's okay. The brain learns in 10 minute increments. And sometimes we need to be disengaged, look disengaged in order to hear what's being said or to make sense of it. Yes. Sometimes we need to tweet about it to know to make, that we're making sense of it. And that might look like disengagement to the teacher when it's really extra engagement. That's, yes. yeah, that's so true. That's so true. It, it actually makes me think of, um, so I won't name names. But there are some people at CAST who um, teach courses and um, well, I guess anywhere. Actually, I've, I've, I've actually, it's not just at CAST, but I've heard it everywhere. People teach courses and, and they don't like their students to have their laptops open. Well, what if they're looking at Facebook? What if they're looking at you know, their Twitter feed? What if they're chatting with their friends online? Um, and I've always, whenever you know, somebody talks to me about that, I've always said if if Facebook and Twitter and talking to their friends is more important than what I'm saying, that's my problem. <laughs> oh, there Not it there. is. Church. Church. <laughs> that's it. Church. It's something that I'm doing wrong that I'm not be, you know, it's and and it's not that it's it's and it's again, it's not about entertaining. I don't need to be the most entertaining thing in the room. I cannot compete with Facebook. I can't compete with YouTube. That's not my job. But if the content that we're talking about or the project that we're doing or the lecture that I'm giving or whatever isn't, you know, if, if something else is more important, then something else is more important at that moment. 
and oftentimes emotional dysregulation is is physiological and that it is can be, yeah. the response to it is to be disengaged. Yeah. So oftentimes taking a break, shifting, and then coming back to it is more effective than just keep persisting through when you're not actually obtaining the information or engaging in the process. Yeah. So Kimberly, I love I love that you plan for that and you tell the, your students that too. It's great. Well, and, and you know, it's the same thing. I think that we all say it, right? So I, t I tell participants in, in my groupings the same thing. I'm like, look, I hope you're getting the best price on Priceline because you deserve it, right? Like treat yourself. You deserve that, right? And so you have to be mindful in, in that moment. Right. And nothing that I say, I could drop the biggest knowledge bomb. Like here is the key to make every kid successful. The one thing, right. This activity will do it and it won't matter because it's not going to resonate with you. Right. So be mindful of where you're at so that you can take all that load off. Right. And then when you come back to us, that's where you're at. Why is that any different for, for, for our students in classrooms? I don't believe that it is. And I think and, that's what you're saying, right, Kim? Yeah, and also, you know, you talk about dropping the knowledge bomb. Make sure that you've dropped it a couple of different times in a couple of different ways. Yes, ma'am. So that you're also then again planning for, you know, someone to be engaged differently for a moment. And that means they haven't missed the, what you've planned for is the most important thing. Yes, ma'am. I agree. Uh, so I'm going to kick it over to, uh, I'm going to, we, we're just getting fired up. This is fantastic. I'm going to kick it over to Sue to see uh, if we have anything going on uh, on Twitter, uh, any questions that are sticking out. Um, so Sue, you got anything for us over there in, in the uh, Twitterverse? Um, no, we're doing a lot of sharing though. There's a lot of good things heading out um, on Twitter. So uh, keep up the great work. This is going to be a, a wonderful um, uh, Storyfy when we get to that. So keep going. There you go. Can, there you I, go. can I add on to a comment that you uh, that all of you have mentioned a number of times, and I just want to hit on again, and that's really to really uh, to really really think about um, the variability. So not only is there variability in how we show that we're engaged. So I might show I'm engaged by looking really intense at you, um, but actually maybe I'm spacing out. <laughs> maybe I'm actually not engaged. And there might be someone who looks like they're looking out the window and they are paying unbelievable attention. So there was someone who worked at CAST and they, oh, they looked totally disengaged as I was talking and we were in a meeting one time. It was driving me crazy. And in fact, he was unbelievably attentive and engaged in what was going on. He just showed it in a really different way. And it took us some communication to say, actually, when I am surfing the net, that helps me pay attention and helps me to be able to focus on what you're saying. So I've noticed it in my own kids and you, know, you, have a, a, you have classrooms of 30, you have lecture halls of 100. There's no way you can tell who's engaged and who's not because we show it in so many different ways. And I realized also that we're talking a lot about this word um, engagement and we haven't talked so much about the word social that goes into this social emotional engagement piece. And I just want to also, in the, in the theme of variability, just highlight how that social piece, there's so much variability to what we mean about social, especially in the digital age that we're in right now. So when we think about students socially in a classroom right now, um, it means a lot of different things and it can look really different. So I thought I would just, just bring the variability word in to, to apply all across all these different, I mean, everyone's talking about it, but I thought I would just really call it out. Right. Um, and make yeah, it I think explicit. that's great. And, <laughs> and also there's cultural variability in what engagement looks like um, that we also need to be aware of. Um, I'll just leave that there. No, I think that's brilliant <laughs> because that brings up this other piece, right? This other dimension to social emotional learning. We have the, at least in the people that, you know, I've kind of talked with and we start really branching out and thinking about this, there are two cultural forces that are happening here, right? One of those cultural forces is culture on this, on this scale of where I come from and who I am and these sorts of things. But there's also culture within the classroom, right? Especially when we were talking about K-12, right? We are moving, we are moving students through this system and many of those students have been together. And if you haven't been together, right, then there's a different cultural thing. So cultural identity creates itself on multiple layers and paying attention to that, that's this huge piece to variability as well. And so I think that, I think that leaving that open-ended is probably smart uh, because that's, that's a whole webinar in and of itself. Um, but, but I think that we need to consider that, like that students are going to form their own culture as students, even while we're teaching them, even before they get to us too. 
right? So uh, and that sense of belongingness and what that means to my learning and how I'm in there is is really, I think that's something that we need to look at. So uh, with that, um, um, I just want to kind of recap. We talk about talking about can we plan intentionally for disengagement, which kind of broaches our next kind of uh, uh, question. Um, should we be focused on the point of engagement? I think that 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 initial engagement is not is, is kind of a consensus that we're not all we shouldn't always be focused on that. Maybe we should be focused on re-engagement and the social side of that. And also what is the variability within what engagement looks like and cultural variability within who we are. Am I kind of summing up that piece? All right, cool. So I'm going to share this this uh, third question. We got two more questions to go. I got to be honest. I'm, I'm, this webinar is going till 10, folks. It's this, it started out saying set, uh, you know from eight to nine, but now it's eight to question mark. I don't know if you folks are, are ready to hang for that. Uh, so uh, here's question three. I'm going to throw it up. So the the idea is so we've kind of talked about social emotional learning. Um, we've talked about its intersection. Uh, we've we've loosened, we've tried to define this really huge concept. So now what can we do to promote social emotional learning in schools? What is that going to start looking like for us? Um, and and uh, if you have tips and, and plans, and Kim, you started kind of touching on this, then Allison, you started touching on this, and then Alexis, you wrote in the chat this really, really great quote that I, I want you to drop uh, in this section because I think it's really brilliant. So I'm gonna start with you. Um, I'm gonna get out of this. I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm gonna let you all kind of go. But Alexis, drop that knowledge bomb. She is muted. She's muted. Uh, yeah, Alexis, you're muted. So the knowledge bomb, wait for it, wait for it. I'm back. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just said thanks, Brian. Um, so uh, I like to remind learners, young and old, especially educators, as we're going through our daily routine, um, that we need to be really compassionate, not only for others that we promote all the time to create a positive learning environment and culture, but really for ourselves. And I think the first step in understanding social emotional learning for ourselves is to take a step back and understand our strengths, some of our vulnerabilities, some of our areas of weakness, and, and really be okay with that and understand that this is all a process. Oftentimes the greatest conversation I have with, with students and educators and parents is that this is all a process. There's no such thing as perfection. And we need to understand that we're only doing the best that we can do every single day with the tools we have. So taking a step back sometimes and reflecting upon that and being more mindful in the moment of, okay, this feels hard, but it won't feel hard forever. <laughs> and I need to use the strategies that have been either prepared or and, and taught to us to be able to, to navigate through these challenging situations and, and understanding that it's all just one big process that we have to help each other through. Oh, see, that's it. That's what I love, right? I love it because it, it reminds me so much of what, what uh, Parker Palmer says, right? About wholeness and the paradox of wholeness. And that wholeness isn't about embracing and coming to what's perfect. It's about embracing the whole thing, even what's broken, right? And I love, I love that connection when we talk about education. I love that connection because it's that idea of artisan teaching. Um, so I just had to have you drop it. It's brilliant. Now, who wants to pick it up after that? Go. <laughs> Mindy's going, nah, I'm good for right now. But see, Mindy, you got something. You're working on something, right? So how do we promote this thing in schools? How do we, how do we start moving it forward uh, and, and having it make more sense as we, as we move forward with intentional planning and, and universal design for learning? Well, I think UDL hey, makes it. Go ahead. Ooh. Ooh. Go no. ahead. Do it, do it, do it. Go for it. Well, I wanted to tell you a story. When I think of engagement, I think of my first grade teacher. Her name is Miss Pickerel. I don't know if she's out there. I'd love it if she were listening in right now. We used to walk down the hallway and you have a, you know, a whole string full of kids. You all can picture the scene and it's loud. And what do most teachers do to students as they're out in the hallways? They're like, shh, shh, shh. Well, Miss Pickerel would play this game where as we're walking along, she would turn around and then we had to freeze. And as we froze, guess what happened? We all got really quiet, right? So it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized, oh my gosh, Miss Pickerel was brilliant. She made walking down the hall brilliant, you know, just so much fun. And she kept us quiet. So she had a very, so I'm gonna tie this to UDL. She had a very clear goal for her class to walk down the hallway quietly. 
And she started to think probably about, well, how could I represent the information? How can I make it clear that this is, you know, this is the way that you behave in the hallway? And how can I model it and act it and um, demonstrate it and have students show me that? But what I love is that she hit on the engagement. She made it engaging so that every one of those students was absolutely, she found a way to make it relevant for a first grade class. I mean, probably if there were a group of adults walking down the symposium hallway and it had to be quiet, that strategy might not work to engage us. It might, but it probably wouldn't. But she met the kids where they were. She, um, she put engagement first and she achieved the goal. So that's a really simple example. That's not a high level learning example, but it's one that I love to think about. Um, and it's because it's the basic way that, um, like Alexis was saying, it's, it's the overall um, emotion that we're bringing to the table as educators, that we're modeling and that we're sharing and that we're creating in the classroom culture and climate. Um, and so that, that's infectious and that takes over and I think um, is really, if, if we can look for those little ways to make little moments engaging and meaningful for students, it goes a long way. Okay, Mindy, your turn. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm gonna tack on to what you said because what I said was boring, what I was gonna say was boring. So <laughs> it's good, it's all good. Um, but I was, I, I think that we often think like social emotional learning has to do with just the like just how I'm feeling right now but it also has to do with being able to understand how to set appropriate goals for yourself and how to um, deal with disappointment and or deal with um, success even sometimes success can be stressful I mean we know from growth mindset that um, you know if you tell kids that they're smart if you keep telling kids they're smart that's stressful that's that's not the best feedback that we can give them um, even though we think it's we're trying to build them up it actually does some can do some damage um, and I think that I completely lost my train of thought after that <laughs> it had something to do with it had some oh oh wait with the high school students so when we're so we often think with high school students well they'll come to us already with these skills in hand and I think that social emotional learning has to go all the way through these students don't magically understand how to set goals for themselves how to deal with um you know how to how to regulate their emotions how to regulate their learning how to get interested in stuff and, you know i had students that they all wanted to be football play professional football players when they when they grew up i can't make everything about football <laughs> what else are you interested in so i can help you get you know what what else can i help you learn so that we can get there too um without killing your dreams because <laughs> i didn't want to do that high school i was i didn't want to damage them um but it, but it i think that it's just as important even in high school college um post-secondary to include really conscious consciously adding those skills into our curriculum and into our daily routine. So, I mean, I'm, nobody's mentioned it yet, but I'm just gonna do it because I was actually waiting for Allison to. I, <laughs> I was about to say it, go for it. Yeah, so the, Yale, the Yale Center ruler, um, that, that four square, and I can put the link in in just a minute um, when I'm done talking, but um, it's, a, it's, it's kind of elementary, but it's a really simple way of kind of pinpointing your emotions. It's a great tool to use. Um, and it's, it's it, it can be just a simple way to, to let me see how I'm feeling about this right now or where do I need to be when I'm learning about this because I don't really like it but I know I have to do it um, because I'm part of school. <laughs> it's, it's well, and, and, and as Mindy's saying, it, it applies, you know, so, so let's say, um, you know, I'm about to give a presentation, I'm about to teach a class and you've just been in awful traffic and you overslept and the photocopier machine wasn't working and you're in a negative place and you know in order to get to where you do your best teaching, you need to move yourself into a different quadrant on this mood meter. I agree with you, Mindy. I think it absolutely applies for adults. So we need to start thinking, well, what are the strategies we can use to move ourselves into a quadrant where we know we can do our best work? And the best work is gonna depend on what the task at hand is for that particular moment. So it's going to change. Yeah, it so is. if I need to do some independent quiet, oh, there it is on your phone, some independent quiet reading, I might not need to be in a very high energized positive place. I might need to be in a more low energy 
positive place for me to do my best reading. And here are the strategies, this is where UDL comes in, I think, here are the strategies that I can use to get me into that place. I think that's, I, th I think that's brilliant. Um, I, I do want to, uh, want to hear what Kim has to say, cause we're wrapping up in our last five minutes here. I cannot believe it's gone this fast. Um, but, uh, uh, Kim, if you can hit me with, with some of your final thoughts around this too. I was thinking that starting with multiculturalism, um, is a really great way to begin broaching social emotional learning and making it, breaking it down, unpacking it for, um, for students. And because everybody's different and everybody has, we all have so many layers to us. And one of the ways that I've been thinking of doing it for high school and college students is to, of talking about pronouns. And how do you want to be addressed, how many pronouns are there and why it's important for you to be addressed by a correct one and why it's important for you to address other people. And that really impacts people's social and emotional states and therefore their learning. And in learning about that, we can learn about social and emotional learning. Ooh, I love it. I love to see how that turns out. Um, so, so summing it up, we got to take it out. We also have to take it in, right? So we got we to gotta look at it in this large scale, but you also have to look internally. Uh, it's kind of getting back to what Alexis was saying. Um, uh, but also, it, it doesn't just start with our high school students, right? Like, and that's an amazing thing, right? When we look at our curriculum, uh, Students go through school one way K-8, right? And then once they hit high school, we're like, okay, we want you to be an independent thinker. Well, there's nothing, we've never given you that, right? Like we've never let you explore that. Um, so I think that uh, that's this huge piece. And, and I like this comment about, well, you got to, you know, using this ruler to kind of figure out <clears throat> where am I at in this task so that I have this almost meta experience about it because I don't have to like it. Like there are certain things I'm just not going to like. Right, like learning how to fix my my hot water heater is not something that I want to do. Right, but I also don't like shelling out a whole bunch of money to fix my hot water heater. So I'm going to just figure it out. Right, but that's that's that whole piece of of, of growth and that's that whole piece of grit. Um, and I love this concept of taking it out and and kind of restructuring this multiculturalism that Kim was talking about, like really restructuring this new interesting place that we're in, where what are pronouns and how do we use them and why is it important that we use them correctly for our, for ourselves and for others. So. Um, gosh, just brilliant. Um, I just want to get everybody's final thoughts and then I got to pay some bills. So uh, any final thoughts? I want to give you a second to kind of think about them. Uh, and then I've, I've already there. got one because I've stolen it. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there's a there's a quote that Dave that's gone around for forever uh, from David Rose and it says that teaching is emotional work at its core teaching is emotional work and um, some people have ch have um, added to that and said that well learning is emotional work too and it absolutely is but I actually think that it's still the same quote because teachers are learners at our core we should be the we're also learners in our classroom and we need to expose that part of ourselves to our learners. We can't just be the, you know, the professorial sage on the stage. We have to expose that, you know, sometimes this is hard for us too. We're not, you know, we don't always have all the answers. Um, so yes, teaching is emotional work, learning is emotional work, but it's all the same thing. And that's a mic dropper. That's a tough one to follow. <laughs> I know. And see, that's what she does. She's like a ninja. She's like a ninja, folks. That's what she does. She sneaks it in right there, and you're like, oh, man. Right? It's, yeah. mm, it's good. What do you got? Anybody else? I'll try. So my background was in fine art. So I often try to go to artwork to try to think of. So this is one that I often use. So not only do I try to paint my hand green just to get paint brushes in, but, um, but I like the analogy that emotions paint the world for us. If we're feeling a particular emotion, that's how we see the world. So if your emotion's in a negative place, everything that teacher is saying is painted with that. And if you're in an awesome place, then you literally are painting the world with that emotion. And so, you know, you may hear from students, um, you know, this teacher doesn't like me or I'm not good at math or that emotion will paint that classroom. So we're really thinking about trying to repaint um, the palette in a little, in, in, in some ways. So now I'm getting all tongue-tied because I don't have a good quote to like just finish it. So I'll just stop right there. 
I love it. Cognitive dismount. Nice. You heard it here first. You heard it here first, folks. You heard it. Network and learn. Cognitive dismount. Boom. That just totally <laughs> that's just I have this great thing planned. Now I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I, I was going to kind of piggyback on everyone and, and to remind us all to use the UDL guidelines to try to be proactive in our thinking, to plan for engagement, and to really remember that um, we are emotional beings and that it's okay to acknowledge that emotions aren't always going to be all positive and that's okay. But what do we do in those moments where emotions get overwhelming or feel really negative? And how do we not only model and teach what that looks like to use skills and strategies, but also kind of normalize it and, and remind our learners that we all feel this way at different points in our lives and it's okay not always on the mood meter to be in the yellow and the green where you are available to learning but what do we do with those times where we're not feeling as good and and how do we prepare ourselves to be expert learners in that way to shift and adapt and use resources and people around you to to be more available to the learning and the experience go for it kim oh all right, I'm so just, I'm just sitting here, my, my jaw's kind of dropping open. But well, in the, in the spirit of where I am right now in doing this, I was going to say make sure that you take care of yourself as an emotional learner. And yes. if that means working out or, um, you know, whatever it is you need to do. And then the next step is to be a little bit meta about that with your, the learners around you and let them share in that experience. Yes, gosh. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining us uh, uh, on the Network and Learn. I got to pay some bills, so, so everybody stick around. But, but our panelists, uh, give, them, give them a virtual clap. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here, right? Yep, the hand clap uh, and spirit fingers. Um, I'm going to share my screen one more time because, like I said, uh, we got to keep the lights on. So <clears throat> here we go. I just want to remind you folks of this. We got some upcoming Network and Learns. Uh, September, we're talking again um, about the research space. We, it was one of our favorite topics last year, so we're looking forward to it. September 12th, uh, again, 8 p.m. Eastern to, to about 9 o'clock because a UDL IRN network and learn party just don't stop. Uh, so, so you want to make sure that you get here for the research base, talking about current trends and implications. We're going to have some great panelists on for that one. And then I'm super excited about this um, uh, for two reasons. Um, so we have a, a, our October Network and Learn series. We're bringing Big David Rose in, um, the, the, the Papa Smurf of UDL, um, coming in. Uh, and please, um, I hope he takes that well. Uh, but he's coming in for an Ask Me Anything session. I'm super excited for the Ask Me Anything session. That relies on our audience uh, to, to really bring the questions uh, that we want to ask uh, David Rose. And those, are, it, it, like it says, it's ask me anything, folks. So I've already got some that are going to be really, really, I want to hear some of the really, really deep wisdom. But then there's just going to be questions about what his favorite color is. Um, so, so I'm hoping that you guys can collect those and bring those. That's October 19th, 8 p.m. Eastern. Okay. Last thing, 2017 UDL IRN Summit. It's coming, folks. Orlando, Florida. It will be magical. Right now, if you have some dying um, need to present, even if you don't have a dying need to present, you want to, um, you, our call for proposals are open right now. And the submission deadline is September 9th, so it's coming up quick. I know a lot of people have a lot of things going on. But if you're not familiar with the UDL IRN Summit, to say that it is just a summit or just a, a place to present um, or just a place to come and hear some people talk is not at all correct. It is an experience unto itself. We get together, we network, we learn from each other. It is a blast. This year I'm unveiling a new suit. I just want to put that out there. If you were there last year, you saw, you saw the uh, plaid suit. This year we got a different game. Um, so uh, you got to at least come for that. There will be brilliant people like Allison Posey, like Mindy Johnson, like Alexis Reed, like Kim Coy, all of these folks and, their, and, and others uh, that you know will be there. So please, call for proposals is open. Um, submit your proposals. Registration will be up, set, up soon, March 29th um, uh, uh, in Orlando, Florida. Right. So last one, UDL chat. If you want to keep this conversation rolling, UDL chat happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. Please, you've got to be there. It's run by some brilliant people. Mindy Johnson, 
Kim Coy, Katie Novak, Kid Hard, uh, Ron Rogers, and Elizabeth Stein. These are heavy, heavy duty hitters, folks in the UDL world. And if, you. I'm, I'm in there, but shh, don't tell everybody. Uh, <laughs> if you want to see what's happening on a daily basis, this is a hashtag to follow, UDL chat. Also want to remind you of our, of our um, own uh, uh, hashtag, which is UDLIRN, hashtag UDLIRN. Come visit us, uh, come follow us. Um, uh, we're trying to put out as much as we can. And then just as, a, as another blanket, go ahead and put out um, just UDL, hashtag UDL. If you tag it with any of those three things, you are bound to join the, the, the growing UDL community, which to me is this fantastic blend of really, really brilliant people doing some really, really great grassroots stuff and they are all super accessible. You can talk to any of them. You can sit down and have dinner with them if you come to the summit, if you come to symposiums. So follow us, follow that hashtag, UDLIRN, join UDL chat or just put UDL in your tweets out there, um, your Vines, your Instagrams, what, your Snapchats, whatever you're doing folks. Uh, however you're getting out there, um, put that in there. Uh, I want to sh shoot it. Uh, any last words from anybody on our panel? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Thank thanks you. so much. Bye, I you guys. Know. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. That's Bye. how we get down at Network and Learn. Uh, come see us in September. Boom. That's it. <laughs> Bye, y'all.